Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. I'm taking a little break from my little break to make this video about a subject that seems to be on the minds of everybody, and that's Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty. If you've ever wondered the background of this or what it actually involves, this is going to be the video that'll tell you. So sit back, enjoy, and let's all learn a little something about the history of Antarctica and Cold War relationships. You know, this is as good a definition as any for the term deterrence. It's defined as the prevention from action by fear of the consequences. Deterrence is the state of mind brought about by the existence of a credible threat of an unacceptable counteraction. Well, as I mentioned in my last video, I'm out for a class right now, and this happens to be the subject of a paper that I wrote for that class, and I thought I'd share some of it with you. Deterrence has three basic parts to it, and I'd like to illustrate that with a little story. Say my daughter and I decide to get in the airplane and head down to Jackson for a $100 hamburger, a little father-daughter time. But it's a beautiful day, it's VFR. I don't happen to check any of the TFRs or the NOTAMs before I leave. Now, on my flight path, I'm going to pass directly over Michigan State University. And I figured it'd be a great time to just point out my old alma mater to my little girl. Unfortunately, it's game day. More unfortunately, turns out the president is a Spartan fan and happens to be attending the game. Can you see where this is going? Well, hi there. Where did you come from? Now, if you look out the window of your little Cessna and you happen to see two of these guys sitting right there, it might be a really good idea to get on 121.5 and maybe have a chat with them because they really want to talk to you. Let's say you don't. What's the next thing that they do? They roll up on the side just to make sure that you really understand they're carrying missiles. This stuff is about to get real. You need to get on the radio. Okay, so this is the first step of an effective deterrence, and that is a credible threat. The second step is the consequences of what happens if you continue your action. I could continue to mind my own business and keep flying down towards Lansing. There's a very good chance that I'm not going to make it that far. Now the third option is to remember that there was a really good hamburger place in Grand Rapids. Make a right turn and head over there. Just leave the area and de-escalate the situation. Well what does this have to do with Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty you may ask? Well in 1945, World War II ended. It was a devastating war for all the countries involved, especially the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union and the United States emerged from that war like punch-drunk champions. We were triumphant, but we had been through a horrible experience. We also realized shortly after the war that we were the dominant two superpowers in the world, and we were eventually going to have to have some sort of a contest between us to see who was going to determine the future of the Earth. Rather than continue the war, we entered a period of Cold War, where we fought wars by proxy and with trade delegations, competing for favor and friends in the Third World manufacturing them out of whole cloth if necessary. Both the United States and the Soviet Union adapted a policy that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This led up to a position in the late 1940s and early 1950s where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were jockeying for position on Earth much like a superpower chess match. Two strategic locations were identified. One was space, the high ground. However, technology at the time prevented significant exploitation of space for military purposes. So essentially, competition there would have to wait for the technology to catch up. Now, since space had to really wait for the 1960s for the technology to catch up, what we could reach in the early to mid-50s was Antarctica. We had the technology to be there. As a matter of fact, America had quite a large presence in Antarctica. If you look at that large bay, that is the location of Little America. The South Pole is slightly inland from that, and if you look past the South Pole from Little America, you will see a large patch of Antarctica as large as the United States. 
We've heard that before, I believe. Here's why Antarctica is strategically significant. First of all, from Antarctica, you can go anywhere in the world. If you look at the three o'clock position here, you'll see the southern tip of Africa. If you look down at the seven and eight o'clock position, you'll see Australia and Tasmania and New Zealand. But notice that there is a large open ocean between Antarctica, Australia, and New Zealand, and between Antarctica and Africa. Well, while the oceans between Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, and Africa are relatively wide, here's the strategic problem, the Drake Passage. The Drake Passage is between the southern tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. It is only a couple of hundred miles wide. Now, in the 1950s, Argentina and Chile were American allies. To get from the Pacific Ocean on the left to the Atlantic Ocean on the right, there were essentially only three routes, if you don't count the summer route across the top of Canada. And that is through the Drake Passage, through the Straits of Magellan, just north of it uh, at the southern tip of South America, and in the Panama Canal. Now. Imagine that there are Soviet air bases and naval bases on the Antarctic Peninsula. We still have the Panama Canal, but it's a relatively small target in an age of nuclear weapons. We have the Straits of Magellan, again, a relatively small target in the age of nuclear weapons. The Drake Passage is easily covered by air and naval assets from bases in the Antarctic Peninsula. And if those are hostile to us, they can restrict our travel between the Atlantic and the Pacific. But even worse, consider this problem from the Soviet standpoint. Their opponent, the United States, owns the Panama Canal. They aren't going through the Panama Canal. Argentina and Chile are U.S. allies. They're not going through the Straits of Magellan. If the United States had air and naval bases in the Antarctic Peninsula, we could essentially shut off their passage between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And recall from the American Civil War, when the Union took control of the Mississippi River, it split the Confederacy in half, and that essentially ended the war. The Soviets could not allow that to occur. This became a flashpoint as superpowers in other countries began to jockey for position in Antarctica and militarize it. Now, how do we prevent the Soviets from taking control of Antarctica and especially the Antarctic Peninsula? We use deterrence, and we use the three elements of deterrence. The first element of deterrence is to present a credible threat. In Operation High Jump in the summer of 1946 to 47, we sent 14 naval ships to Antarctica, including an aircraft carrier. This carrier task force was sent to Antarctica not to hunt secret Nazi bases or wipe out the last of the Tartarian Empire. It was a very public display of, and a show of force to demonstrate to the Soviets that Antarctica was well within our reach, we could project power there, and we could literally occupy it at any time of our choosing. Okay, let's say that the Soviets ignore the show of force, the first stage of deterrence, and they go ahead and they set up a naval base and a couple of airstrips on the Antarctic Peninsula. Now the second stage of deterrence comes in. You may have won a round, but you're not going to enjoy it. Because in this case, you're going to have company, and lots of it. Antarctica is closer to South America in friendly territory than the Hawaiian Islands are to the west coast of the United States we would probably have a dozen bases set up in short order around the continent of Antarctica and around their base on the Antarctic Peninsula. And every Friday night, there would be a low-level Mach 2 pass over their officers' club. And every Saturday morning, there would be a tongue-in-cheek letter of apology from one of a dozen air base commanders in Antarctica apologizing for the errant flight. And quite frankly, if they so much as shot a BB gun in the general direction of the aircraft, recall that Eisenhower was president and Curtis LeMay was head of the Air Force. It would not have worked out well. Now, at the beginning of the video, I said that there were three basic principles of deterrence. The first one is a very public and credible show of force. That was what Operation High Jump was. 
nothing else. The second is, okay, so you go ahead and do it anyhow. Good for you. You're not going to enjoy it. The Soviets knew that if they actually established a base on the Antarctic Peninsula, we would have a dozen bases in short order surrounding them. This is our neighborhood. The third principle of deterrence is give them another option. Is there something that is more mutually beneficial that we could do other than fight a war over penguins? And that was the Antarctic Treaty. You know, there seems to be some controversy over what the Antarctic Treaty actually says. It's a very short document. There's only 14 articles. Let's just go over them and see exactly what it has to say. Now, Article 1, as you would be expecting, no military activity, no military occupation, no military maneuvers, no testing of weapons. You can have a few troops here and there just for local security but you're not going to be fortifying or militarizing the continent. That's it. Everybody agreed to it. Now, Article 2 refers to the International Geophysical Year. That was 1957 to 58, the year before the treaty was worked out. During the International Geophysical Year, scientists from all over the world studied the Earth to learn more about it and exchanged uh, scientific information and did cooperative studies. It was kind of cool. Now, in Antarctica, one of the Russian meteorologists spent the winter at Little America, and one of the American meteorologists spent the winter with the Russians. We all sat around the campfire and sung Kumbaya and talked about how great science was, and everybody wanted to go ahead and continue that. Now, Article 3 is actually kind of an interesting article. It says that all science in Antarctica will be coordinated amongst the different powers. Uh, we don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to sit down and do studies, for example, that need to be done at several different locations at the same time. There needs to be some coordination. We want to be able to exchange personnel with the other stations. Antarctica doesn't belong to anyone. Science does not belong to any one nation. Any findings from Antarctica need to be shared with the United Nations and the world. Very noble idea of what science is. Now, Article 4 has to do with the seven nations that claim territory in Antarctica prior to the treaty. It says that by signing the treaty, you're not giving up those claims. You're not enforcing those claims either. Uh, they'll be left for a later date. Now, the important thing is that the Russians and the United States both did not recognize anyone else's claims in Antarctica. We reserved the right to make our own, but we chose at this time not to make claims of land in Antarctica. Now, Article 5 is a fascinating aspect of the Antarctic Treaty. Most people consider the Antarctic Treaty the first arms control treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union. Antarctica is to be a nuclear-free zone. You will not detonate weapons there. You will not dispose of materials there. Nukes just stay out of the entire continent, and everybody agrees. Article 6, the Antarctic Treaty covers everything south of 60 degrees south latitude. It does not interfere with freedom of navigation of the high seas. That's it. Now, Article 7 has a couple of parts to it. It's mostly concerned with the fact that all parties of the Antarctic Treaty have a right to inspect the facilities, personnel, military, weapons, anything that is introduced to Antarctica by any other party. They can do aerial reconnaissance to make sure that they're being honest. But this is an interesting section right here, Section 5. All expeditions to and within Antarctica on the part of its ships or nationals and all expeditions to Antarctica organized in or proceeding from its territory. They have to tell everybody else who's coming to Antarctica. So if you want to charter a ship in Miami and sail down to Antarctica, the United States government has an obligation to know about that and to inform the other members of the treaty. You're welcome to go, but you have to tell somebody that you're going. Now, just as an aside, there's no 911 in Antarctica. If you go to Antarctica, you are responsible for making arrangements in advance for your own rescue should it be needed. There are no doctor's offices or emergency rooms there. Surprisingly, they do have ATMs, but they don't have courts. If you break the law in Antarctica, you will be detained by security and sent home. 
your home country will deal with you. Now, some of the more astute viewers may have noted that in the last section I talked about breaking the law in Antarctica. Well, what law is that? In Antarctica, you are subject to the laws of your home country, and they are responsible for your conduct. So if you do something that would be illegal back home in Antarctica, you're going to be detained and sent back home, and they're going to deal with you. Now, sections 9, 10, and 11 refer to the Antarctic Treaty Committee. This is kind of like the Board of Governors for Antarctica. It's a little mini UN. All the signatory members of the treaty have a seat at, at this meeting, and they just discuss the various things that have to do with the operation of the Antarctic Treaty. Section 12 talks about modifications and renewal of the treaty. Section 13 tells you how the treaty needs to be ratified. And Section 14 just basically says it's uh, being reproduced in all the languages of the signatory members. That's all there is to the Antarctic Treaty. You know, the Antarctic Treaty was a remarkable document. Uh, it was a peace document. It was a arms limitation document. It was a document for international cooperation in science. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to see more of things like this and my other videos, hit that little like and subscribe down in the lower right corner. This is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. We'll see you again soon.